Hi, this is Tamson Granger. This is Dan Abuhoff. With Tamson and Dan, read the paper on Sunday, February 3rd, 2019, Super Bowl 53. Yeah, 53. Good. We're, we're getting ready. Yeah, we're getting ready. Not really. Like everyone else, we're doing a <laughs> podcast to get ready for the Super Bowl. We always watch the Super Bowl. We uh, generally don't go to Super Bowl parties. Right. You know why? Because we watch the game. Yes. <laughs> Daniel watches the game. You know, people invite us to parties, and no, they no, always... Let's not exaggerate. Not they, so many people invite us to parties. No, but people do. Well, yeah. people have figured it out. Yeah. But uh, generally, when someone invites you to a Super Bowl party, they say something like, don't worry, we're not going to really watch the game. They say that to it's you. It's not about the game. No one says that to me. Uh, but, uh, anyway. But, but then again, I don't get invited. Since the problem is, <laughs> yeah. you want to watch the game. Yeah. I'm the problem. Uh, you're actually interested in uh-huh. what's going on, even if you have no what? dog in this race. And yet I do. You do. <laughs> but, uh, because of the illegal gambling oh, going on you know, is at such, your workstation. It's such a harsh word, illegal. You should be careful with that word. You know, Let your lawyer figure out what's legal. So uh, speaking as your lawyer, let, let's jump into this. So last night, as we are wont to do, we went to the cinema. We went to the movies. And we saw... The Upside. The Upside. In part because uh, one of my students recommended it. Oh, was that? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Because I always ask the students, uh, anybody go to the movies this weekend? And generally, no. Uh, oh. As you know, uh, Americans don't seem to go to the movies anymore. Yeah. Uh, they watch it on the small screen. Oh, that some of their, them do. Their yeah. uh, oh. iPad or their telephone or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, actually, students had been to a bunch of stuff. And uh, I did get a recommendation for The Upside, a remake of a French film, The Untouchables. Mm -hmm. Which was very successful in Europe. and Not uh, so much here. Yeah. It's a story of a wealthy, paralyzed person who uh, hires questionable help and how it all works out fabulously yeah well yeah and it was uh, a little bit uh, slapstick oriented the european version at least it seemed to me when i saw the advertisements and you here we had brian cranston as the paraplegic we had kevin hart as the unqualified aide nicole kidman's in the movie she's actually very good um and but the question is you know is, is this going to be kind of a crazy goofy movie with kevin hart jumping off the walls and whatever the answer is uh, no it's not so bad it's pretty decent yeah. It wasn't too cute. No, it wasn't too cute. It didn't work too hard. It wasn't too manic. I thought it would be manic. Uh, it was, if anything, it might have been slower than uh, was appropriate for some people's tastes. But uh, it was reasonably thoughtful. Yeah. Well, suddenly, after Network, I'm a Brian Cranston fan. Oh, good for you. So I guess part of my feeling was I had hope because if Cranston's in it, yeah. um, you know, uh, maybe it's going to be good. Yeah. Also... I do sort of like Kevin Hart. I know you like Kevin Hart. Um, you don't have to apologize so, for that. So there is that. Yeah. Now, this movie has, you know, kind of a, uh, a troubled past. Right. It took a long time to make. Um, it was in and out about who would direct it, right. who would be in it. And even once it was done, because it was, I guess, linked up with the Weinstein um well, yeah. Business. Uh, it had to get released. It, it, its release was delayed right. by almost a year. But you didn't mention the other reason we wanted to see it. We had to see it. We had to see it because actually part of it is shot in Bucks County. Matter of fact, the critical, some would say the critical scene in the movie, which is based on the setting of all things, it takes place at a restaurant, the Black Bass Inn, which not only is very nearby to us, but you have a long history with. And it is used to great effect, quite honestly. Yeah. Yeah, but the whole movie, although it takes place in New York, yeah. shot in Philadelphia. Because it looks a lot more like New York it, it than New York funny. does. Yeah, because yeah, I told you at one point he's buying a house, yeah. and I'm thinking, for no good reason, I didn't know it was shot in Philadelphia, I'm thinking, gee, those look an awful lot like houses in Philly. Yeah, well, we didn't know that until um, afterwards. But maybe but, Queens has that too, but, but or it, wherever. It, it was but. funny, though, that we were showing the Black Bass in and, and, and the bridge, which we even talked about here, this Roebling Bridge, which is right next to, adjacent to the Black Bass Inn, crossing the, the, the Delaware River. And you look at it and you say, oh, that's fantastic scenery. That's, that's striking. 
And then you say, well, we kind of see that every day. <laughs> we, should, we should appreciate it a little bit more. But in any event, anyway, so we can recommend that. I don't think it's a great movie, but it's it's surprisingly worth seeing. I, I mean, I describe it as sort of a rom com. Yeah, um, it, it's not romantic between the two guys. It's romantic, but yeah. romantic, yeah. yeah. And they, you know, they argue, they bond, yeah. they right. argue, right. Uh, they break up, they come yeah. back together. Oh, well, that's um, true. That's they both just... learn from each other. Right. right. Um, now, you're, 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 we're not selling people with this description. It's, it's a little. It's, it's better than that. But it, it's not so formulaic, I think. But it's a little bit formulaic. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So two, two other quick recommendations, because sometimes people say it's, it's useful to get recommendations. Uh, and here's a movie which you might not have heard about. It's a documentary, and it's called They Shall oh, Not Grow Old. Oh, the Bobbitt documentary? No, no we're skipping Lorena that. Lorena Bobbitt? Not interested in that. Oh, Although really? the Times is, for reasons I don't understand. Uh, but Front page of the Times. Yeah. They Shall Not Grow Old, which is a documentary spearheaded by Peter Jackson, Right, Peter Jackson of Lord of the Rings, and what he did was he was supplied with archival footage of uh, World War One, uh, and it's this choppy, uh, you know, newsreel type footage that we've all seen in one form and the other and another. And what he they did was his team did was they digitally restored the footage, they adjusted the frame rate so it's no longer uh, choppy, they colorized it, they converted it to three D. Not only did they do that, but they changed the sound completely. They they supplied a lot of sort of background sound that after research they decided would have been appropriate for the battle scenes. They hired lip readers to see what the uh, actual people in the archival footage were likely saying. Really? And hired actors to mouth those words. Wow. And all brings this to life. And what they... Uh, as Jackson says, the re- well, the, the article says, uh, the re- this is by Mikado Murphy in, the, in, in, in Times a month ago. Um, it was just released just uh, this week. The result is a transformation that is nothing less than visually astonishing. Jackson says the clarity was such that these soldiers on the film came alive. Their humanity just jumped out at you, which I can believe. And So it- that is... They shall not grow old. They shall not grow old. It's and not, it's out in theaters now. Well, that's not. The Times isn't even clear on that. It's starting to get released. It's not clear how it's ultimately going to be distributed. Maybe it'll be on Netflix. Who knows? But it's interesting too that it starts with black and white, and then it goes to the color in the 3D, uh-huh. and it goes black and black and white, back to black and white. And someone says to Jackson, "Did you set it up that way? It's like the Wizard of Oz. You know, it's just transformation." He says, "No, it's very expensive to colorize. <laughs> we only wanted to colorize." A half hour, so we threw that in the middle. So there are some technical well, limitations. That's kind of funny. Well, I'd be interested to see that. The uh, yeah. World War One, obviously, brutal, brutal yeah. war uh, that really woke up Britain. Right. In well, a lot wait a minute. Like we saw those photos of these war t- these kids in wartime. They're eighteen years old or twenty well, that, years old. That, well, that was World War Two. That was leading up to World War Two. It was, it was, it was similar, yeah. but World, yeah. no, World War One uh, has had its own uh, it's reality a brutality, and brutality, yeah. 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 Um, and. Uh, it's uh, it should be fascinating. Yeah, uh, and again, quickly we recommend that. The other thing that we recommend has been around a little bit, and the question you always have is: Is it worth still going? And that's My Fair Lady, which is at Lincoln Center, and they recast it, as you have to do after some time. Uh, and in fact, in the main part, Lauren Ambrose, uh, who uh, was the central role, has been replaced as Eliza. As Eliza, yes, has been replaced by uh, uh, Lauren Benati. And Laura Benanti. Benanti. Benanti, yes. Correct. Benanti. 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 Right. Who's and we f- are Laura Benanti fans. We are Laura Benanti. We have yes. seen her in Cabaret. And, he, he, and she's humorous. Right. She's a wonderful singer. Right. She has a great presence. Right. I wouldn't mind seeing this. Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't. Her. Now you're telling me. Oh, here's the deal, okay? The Lauren Ambrose production was fine. We enjoyed it. It's It, it was more than fine. Uh, but. Um, Here's what the Times says, and I, I'll interpret this for you, because this is Times speak, and then we'll do the real English. The Times speak is, quote, I mean no disrespect to Lauren Ambrose, who originated the role in this revival, to say that Ms. Benante is a more effortless vocalist. She dispatches her very difficult and wide-ranging songs with glee, whereas in Ms. Ambrose's performance, getting through them sometimes seemed like a metaphor for the character's struggle. Okay, mm. so what mm. that means is, uh, Lauren Benanti, Laura Benanti can sing, 
And and that distinguishes yeah, she's her. She's a terrific soprano. And unbe- she can st- she's right up there with Julie Andrews. She doesn't it doesn't give an inch to Julie Andrews. And she is therefore, I am sure. And and what they say about Laura Marambos is true. I think it became part of the character. She was bringing herself, you know, together to gather herself to do everything, including the songs, which I think was kind of useful. Whereas uh, Laura Benanti is going to belt it out, and frankly, should be a much more formidable character. Uh, again, calling Rex Harrison, but we don't have him available. So they love it. Uh, I expect it's worth seeing. They also are excited about Rosemary Harris, who's 93, being in there. So Rosemary Harris... 93. ...plays Henry Higgins' mother. mother replacing Diana Rick. 93. 93, and they and say she's she great. she gets a great review... A new hero for me. Yeah. Um, and Danny Bernstein. 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 And we've seen him in a lot of stuff. He yeah. is a pros pro. That's a, that's and the easiest way. He's playing. He's most recently in The Fiddler on the Roof in the big production. Right. He, he plays, uh, who does he play? Oh, he plays the. Um, Eliza Doolittle's dad. The dad, exactly right. He plays uh, I'm Getting Married in the Morning. He does that song. Right. Uh, it's Get Me to the Church on Time. Right. And I'm sure he's great in that. All right. Well, See it. Yeah. I, and I know someone who did see it. Joe Moody saw it, and he loved it. So there you go. Yeah, I would I would be tempted to see it again, even though it's one of those uh, musicals you know so well. Yeah. You're kind of singing along the whole time. Well, we'll talk about it. All right. Um, anyway, so the Grammys are coming up. Yeah. Well, we know, like, next to nothing about the Grammys. Uh, but. Nothing. <laughs> but the. Uh, I'm next to you, but article, now I know nothing. Yeah. But there was an article in Arts and Leisure hmm. about uh, the, um, the music video. Now, category. I'm going to let you give the name of this video. Uh, yeah, you will. Okay. Um, I have no problem with that. It's a video by Beyonce and Jay Z called Ape Shit. Great. And the reason that caught my eye, eye is because I have been watching that video yeah. uh, since it came out. Mm-hmm. I find it kind of terrific. I find it fascinating. It takes place in the Louvre. And all the performances are in the Louvre in front of various works of art, mm-hmm. uh, on grand stairways, etc. And uh, it's really, I think, very... Provocative, very evocative, uh, and I show it in my classes at the beginning of the term mm-hmm. to kind of spark interest and conversation about what is art, what is a museum, who goes to museums, what should uh, museums uh, encompass mm-hmm. at this point, and uh, it's uh, really kind of terrific. Uh, I have to, let me just give one quote from the article about this and other um, music videos that are up for an award. He says, for a recalibration of that dynamic um, that he's talking about, there is apeshit, the audacious Jay-Z and Beyonce video filmed in the Louvre which proposes that black beauty and creativity belongs in museums too, and no exclusively white space should remain that way. And one of the interesting things about this, Hmm. Louvre attendance has gone up dramatically. (laughs) Because of the video? Since since the release of the video. Wow. And uh, it really, um, you know, it's interesting to see uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z standing there next to, in front of the Mona Lisa. And it's like, talk about celebrities. Yeah, and wow. I just sort of imagine them saying, hey, All right. hey Mona so we Lisa, have a, we have a, we're celebrities, you're a celebrity, maybe we should hang out. And they do. It's not the biggest painting in the world. Ape shit. Yeah, well, that's, it, uh, now we have a stake in the Grammys, Not very, Not totally acceptable to uh, our demographic. Yeah. Uh, accessible, uh, but uh, worth... Looking at, in my mind. Okay. Talk about totally acceptable. The Super Bowl. Accessible. You, you, well, acceptable. Both. Uh, the Super Bowl is uh, upon us. So we got to say something about football. So there have been a zillion articles about it. And here's what I think is interesting. Number one, how are these teams there? And one of the big themes uh, that I think is, is correct is, you know, every team's got a few stars. But the teams that get to the Super Bowl are able to make a chicken salad out of chicken something else with the last 15, 20 players. The supporting players are better. How do they do it? And uh, and the truth is, one of the ways they do it is that they take guys who are bad guys. 
And other teams cut them because they can't deal with them and they take them on the team. You mean bad behavior? They're good players, but yeah, they're... That, that's exactly right. Head cases, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. So the Rams have uh, Aqib Talib. They have Adama Kungsa. They have Dante Fowler. They have a guy named Marcus Peters. All these guys were in trouble in various ways. Do they turn them around? Uh, when they're still bad, they just put up with it. Well, uh, they don't give report cards, but the fact is they managed to get them together to play well for a season or two. And that's what's uh, those are, those guys I just mentioned are on the Rams, uh, and they're having good seasons. Now, they're all different stories. It's not worth going into them, and maybe this magic will last, or maybe it won't. Winning cures a lot of problems, uh, but that's part of it. And the same thing, look, New England does the same thing. I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, Corey Dillon uh, was a bad guy in some people's view. Randy Moss was considered incorrigible. He became a tremendous star on the Patriots. They succeed with some of these players, and they do it all the time. So it's not like they got all the Boy Scouts in their team. That's not it. The other thing that uh, was written about, was an economist wrote this article. It said one of the things that the smart teams do is they value their draft picks differently. They understand that it's a tendency to overvalue the present versus the future. And for that reason, if you're smart, what you do is you make trades, trading your high picks for uh, picks future picks, and you get many more of them because people say, well, I'm not going to worry about that now. That's next year. That's the year after. And there's an article, an economic article that was published in this, and the first version of this article that came out apparently some years ago was read by none other than Bill Belichick. And Bill Belichick has been doing this for years. So he's been putting, you know, uh, delaying gratification, waiting for picks coming in later, and they've filled out the team that way pretty effectively. And you can only do that if you have long-term job security. That's the real thing. If you're a first-year coach or second-year coach, you don't know how long you're going to be around. You don't trade away draft picks and hope to get something two years later because you're not going to be there. you got to make okay. something happen. Okay. So there's that. And so I thought that was interesting. I think that, well, is, that is interesting. That's back to like uh, the big picture, uh, the long-term right. versus the short-term. Exactly. I mean, that works in a lot of aspects of life, I guess. But at a certain point, don't the future picks become present picks? They do. That's the magic yeah. of it. So what he does is he's famous for trading away a first-round pick for two second-round picks the next year. And then next year, he's got an extra player. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, and it goes on from there. And the third thing, and again, I don't want to make this an all-football show. So this is the last football point I'll mention. There's been a lot of writing about Tony Romo. And the article in the Times is by Frank Bruni, who is really not a football guy. He's, he used to be a food guy. Now he's an op-ed guy. Uh, and his article is called Tony Romo Super Bowl Psychic. But this is a theme that you've seen. A lot of people are excited. Tony Romo is a great broadcaster because he can predict what the quarterbacks are going to do. He can guess the plays correctly. Okay. I do think Tony Romo is a great announcer, but that's not what he's doing. They okay, have it all wrong. Okay. Tony Romo is not predicting what the quarterback is going to do. Tony, Tony Romo is telling him what the quarterback should do. Okay. Those are two different things. And because so, he was a quarterback, because he, he knows very well. There's, that's half of it. The other half of it, he's sitting above the action with a bird's eye view seeing the defense and seeing the offense and seeing the shifting. So he knows to a fairly well what the best move is, what the play is. And he is, because he's an expert, saying what that is. Okay? What ha- what the quarterback is doing is getting it right to a large degree. <laughs> and the point is it's not – the article shouldn't be about – Tony Romo's getting it right. It should be the quarterback starting to get it right. And, no. and But let me tell you one my final, final point about this. So they're observing he's, he's good in the regular season, but he's great in the playoffs. You know why he's great in the playoffs? Because the quarterbacks in the playoffs are better. <laughs> <laughs> it's the quarterbacks who are better in the playoffs, not Romo. He's the same guy. But he is very good. He's he, very good. Even for a layperson like myself. Yes. The first time I heard him yes. uh, commentating, and I didn't even know who he was, yeah. I said, wait a minute, this is better. This guy is better. Yeah. And uh, he's pretty unflappable. He's, uh, you know, easy to understand, I find, uh, even if you're not an expert. There's a great Tony Romo quote I'll read at the end of the podcast, which okay. is, I think sums up the situation. I like Tony Romo. But, but, but part of the Super Bowl is, is food, and you have the antidote for us. You have the thing that we should be eating during the Super Bowl, and it is none no, other no, than... No, 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 I'm not, I'm, you know, I got a lot of stuff about right. food. We haven't yeah. talked about food in a while. Go ahead. Uh, Wall Street Journal, 
uh, actually okay. has a big article about frozen food. Oh, oh I, okay. I thought you were going to something else. Go ahead. Um, no, I will go to so, something else. And, uh, you know, newsflash, newsflash, uh, you know, freezing things keeps them fresh. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we've known that for a long time, haven't we? Yes. Uh, why is this news? I knew it. Uh, and uh, the thing is that now it's all the rage to buy, you know, fresh, never frozen items have more availability. But the truth is, if those things have been sitting on a truck two weeks to get to you or sitting in uh, the refrigerated section of the uh, supermarket uh, waiting for you to come in, uh, a lot of the nutrition ha- and flavor has dissipated. So, um, you know, uh, the... Uh, Wall Street Journal is making a big fuss. They also had an interesting uh, recipe promoting slow-cooking steaks, Mm. which is supposed to be very, very good. Now, uh, I've had a slow-cooked steak, and the idea is that you sear the the meat, whatever kind of meat it is, and then slow-roast it. That is at a very low temperature, maybe 200 degrees, in the oven until it's done. They say it's infallible, Uh uh, vastly superior methodology, and you can do it with uh, steaks right out of the freezer. Uh, Who am I to complain? Yes. But if you, you know, if you want to have some classic sort of snack food, what's more classic than baked brie or cheese? Yes. Okay. Baked cheese. In the puff pastry. Now, this was all the rage starting in about the 1970s. So, of course, we're quite familiar, having been around in the 1970s. And in the New York York Times, in the uh, magazine section... Uh, an article by, again, I apologize for my pronunciation, Te Jal or Te Hal Rao, uh, writes an article about how you can improve any supermarket camembert by wrapping it in frozen puff pastry and baking it in the oven. If you like, slice it in half, put a little bacon and caramelized onions in the middle, and it will be even better. All right. um, car- camembert is a wonderful cheese, but when do you get a really good one at the height of its ripeness, uh, well-crafted, etc.? Pretty much never. Oh, really? And okay. We're always tempted, right? Because we know we like camembert, even though it's stinky. Um, and uh, every now and then I do buy one of those little wheels, and they are pretty much universally uh, forgettable. Oh, okay. So this is good news that A, we're allowed to go back in time to the 70s and uh, make uh, the um, the standard baked cheese a favorite. And I do, there's a recipe in the Times, I do trust the Times recipes, and I do trust Rao's recipes. Remember I made that uh, nice grain bowl yeah. the other night that was based on uh, oh, really? a Rao recipe. Okay. Um, so there you have that. And now... I mean, sometimes food makes you happy, but if you really want to be happy, go to Aristotle. Yeah. There's a nice little article in the Wall Street Journal this weekend by Edith Hall, who, it turns out, has a book called Aristotle's Way, How Ancient Wisdom Can Change Your Life. Okay, so it's basically a nice little self-help book Mm -hmm. um, with Aristotle as your guru or mentor. And uh, it uh, revolves around um, Aristotle's ethical system and the idea that the goal of human life is happiness. Aristotle didn't equate happiness with wealth pleasure or fame for him happiness was an internal state of mind or contentment that we can acquire only by living life in the best way possible now aristotle you know um spent a lot of time with like he was the tutor to alexander the great and he hung out with the macedonians who were crazy Mm -hmm. right and uh he realized that these people had everything, power, money, you know, uh, plenty of wives and concubines and still weren't happy. So maybe this is part of what uh, galvanized him into figuring out happiness. And uh, real happiness, he believed, comes from a continuous effort to be the best possible 
version of yourself, okay? He analyzed the wide range of traits that people have, yeah. including libido, courage, anger, etc. All of us possess these properties and happiness comes from cultivating each one in the correct amount, okay? So he wasn't a guy who believed that you have, these are the virtues, these are the vices. Um, emotions feelings can be can go either way mm -hmm. uh, depending on how you deal with them anger is not necessarily a bad thing not necessarily a vice it can be a positive thing if it galvanizes you into um, positive action standing up for yourself mm -hmm. or for someone else mm -hmm. because you're angry uh, about a situation but if you go go to excess then it turns into a vice. So it's kind of uh, figuring out and maintaining this balance. Fiscal responsibility, you know, can uh, range from, the article says parsimony or cheapness to reckless spending. Uh, some way you find a balance uh, between those things. We flourish by cultivating the virtues in relation not just to ourselves. We have a public responsibility as well, also to our friends and neighbors and fellow citizens. We can pursue our happiness as individuals, but if we understand Aristotle's principles, that help us make the public arena a better place as well. All right. I'll have to look at that. That's, that's a little tricky for me. But okay. Uh... All right. Well, here's uh, here's. It's a little tricky, but I think it's all about finding balance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in yeah. these different aspects. All right. I will look at that article. Life. The uh, here's something that uh, perhaps is not nearly as deep, but this is making somebody happy. Uh, it's a fellow named Barakat uh, Payeva who cuts fish. And why are we talking? Well, we about know uh, we we love we all love a good YouTube, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's it, it's yeah. So here's the deal. All right. Let's describe the situation. Barakat Payeva. Uh, as described by Priya Krishnas in an article in the Times, uh, as a fish cutter. And here's how she describes the scene. He deftly sharpens an eight-inch knife uh, against the water stone before plunging it into a silver-scaled fish and sawing off the collar, using another bigger knife to lop off the bone. Then in a single motion, he slid the knife down the length of the fish on one side, made another slice. After a few strokes, he carefully peeled away the rib cage, splayed open the fish, which split into four neat sections. This man, Mr. Paiva, is the highest volume fish cutter at the popular Boston wholesaler, Wolf's Fish, and here's the key, has become something of a celebrity at a job that normally doesn't attract much attention. He has, as you alluded to a moment ago, a series of videos, YouTube videos on his cutting skills that are also posted on Instagram, and they have drawn hundreds of thousands of views. People are watching videos of Barakat Paiva cut fish and we did too we saw it this morning and the yeah. truth is he's pretty amazing he takes these huge fish he cuts them into pieces and it's kind of amazing and according to everyone who discusses it uh he's a wunderkind no one else can cut fish like this it's not nearly as easy as he makes it look they quote a guy who runs a restaurant he says he's honored just to get the fish that barricade cuts he's excited he's going to get it so he can make it into dinner with people he's an amazing guy and he's just super competent and loves what he does He's a former soccer player. He is. And he's a big, strong guy. Well, there you go. I would say, having seen the video, yeah. I would say 8-inch uh, is... Uh, he was using bigger knives. Really? Actually. They yeah. were big, long knives. But they you have to be strong. You have to take care of your knives and have them well sharpened to be able to slice through but, but those beyond, big fish. But like here's that. the question. The question is, how is it that people are tuning into videos watching a man cut fish? And I and I but I think I, I sympathize with that. I think they're right. I think when someone does anything really well, no matter what it is, they do it really well with a certain flair in a way that no one else can do it and they're super competent and super accomplished, it's worth watching. And that's what you have. Yeah. So I think there are videos of everything now. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. I'm wondering if there are videos of butchers. Uh, I don't know. Let's, I think that would be more scary. Hey, let's, I mean, let's, I have seen butchering. Let, let's stop with this. Oh, let's not take it any further. But you're right. Um, it, it, he's a phenomenon. Generally, generally, when somebody is confident and skilled yeah. in whatever 
their craft is. Yeah. It is fun to watch. And the, okay. look, the proof is in the pudding. People think, are flocking to all right, this. Again, new ideas for my brothers in retirement. Oh, Steve, ahead. Bryce, are you listening? Cutting okay. fish. No. Repairing cars. All right. Okay. Videos on they could, I don't know what they could change. Maybe the way they change the spark plug. The cars even have spark plugs now. I don't know. But um, right. it, it's an idea. Well, I'll take this offline. But, all right. So in any event, uh, go ahead. You had a couple of books. Yeah, in the review section of the Wall Street Journal, uh, there are some recommendations, uh, you know, reviews of various books. Another one is another translation of Dante's Inferno. Yeah, another, another, another. Well, there are hundreds. Yes, there, there are. Hundreds. There are hundreds. Um, and, you know, uh, of course, because to uh, make a work like that appeal, yeah. uh, you need... Uh, to be able to speak in the language of the time right. and the context of the time uh, to some extent to make uh, those stories come alive mm -hmm. for the current audience. Now, I'm familiar with the translation by uh, Princeton professor uh, Robert Hollander mm -hmm. and his wife, Jean Hollander. In fact, I took a night class yeah. at uh, Mercer County Community College a few years ago with Jean Hollander. Oh, really? And uh, she led us through the Inferno, and that was pretty fantastic. Mm. Um, she, I also took Purgatorio <laughs> and uh, Paradiso. Let me tell you something. The Inferno is much more fun than Paradise or Purgatory. Okay. Because sinners are more fun. The stories of sinners are more interesting. All right. you know. But one? anyway, this new one is uh, it's called Hell, Dante's Divine Trilogy Part 1 by Alastair Gray. He's a Scottish. He has economized. Uh, this is a much shorter version mm -hmm. of the Inferno than we usually see. And he has really um, put it into his own sort of lexicon and his own vision. Mm -hmm. And it even has some of his own illustrations. So that might be fun to do. Some other notable translations. Yeah. You know, there's a translation by Dorothy Sayers. Do you know who she is? Yeah. Uh, so she's a mystery writer. Right. Uh, I love Dorothy Sayers. Right. I love Lord Peter Whimsey. Right. Uh, but uh, she thought her best work was translating the Inferno. Also, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, hmm. first American. Right. So if you're not interested in the Inferno, hmm. and it is an awful lot of fun if hmm. you can get through it, um, how about a book about Paris? Who doesn't love a book about Paris? And here we have City of Light by Rupert Christensen. And it's the story of the, the headline in the Wall Street Journal is The Man Who Lit Up Paris. And that would be Baron Georges Eugène Haussmann, okay, who, uh, who worked for Louis Napoleon, mm -hmm. otherwise known as Napoleon III, otherwise uh, known as the nephew mm -hmm. of the Napoleon, uh, and uh, between the two of them, Hausman creates Paris as we know it today. The wide avenues, the vast parks, extravagant new public buildings like the Paris Opera, which I think uh, is visible from your uh, Debevoise yes. right. uh, Paris office, uh, Les Halles, uh, the market, glass-covered market, um, and also projects to renovate and preserve buildings such as Notre Dame and Saint-Chapelle, that little jewel of a chapel. And uh, he really brought Paris mm -hmm. out of, well, out of the medieval kind of took its medieval core, mixed in 19th century industrial uh, advancements, industrial revolution, and creates the modern city we see today. It's really uh, the beginning of that foundation myth of modern city planning, the story of a capable city administrator and an autocratic ruler who sought legitimacy by making, you know, by aspiring to make Paris the center of the modern universe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting story. He doesn't, uh, apparently, uh, Christensen doesn't really advance, uh, change um, the, uh, you know, it doesn't bring any new uh, stories to light about Hausman, but does 
kind of explain how this all happened. How did it happen financially? Um, It was not a small thing to raise the money to do all this. Uh, How was that done? There was some amount of scandal. He ends up getting fired. Uh, Napoleon III gets deposed. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, the the Prussians are are marching in. But uh, um, it's funny. At the top of the article, there's a quote by Robert Moses. Uh, talk about your yeah, city that administrators right. yeah, yeah. saying, if the end doesn't justify the means, what does? Yeah, well, so, that sounds right. So that might be a All fun right. read. All right. So on the subject of Paris, Michel Legrand passed away. Now, Michel Legrand, a great uh, composer, songwriter, uh, jazz performer, uh, 86 years old. Um, and there are various tributes uh that we ran into. Uh, there was a nice article by Melissa Erico, who we've seen perform at 54 Below, who's a great recording artist and performer, who talked about recording with Michelle Legrand. She had some wonderful stories about him. But there also was an article by Michael Bourne, who's one of the big DJs at WGBO, uh, which sponsored the uh, Jazz Fest that we saw at Mohawk. So what are his, what are his famous things? Uh, his same songs of... are the umbrellas of Cherbourg, but uh, so but individual so that was songs. A film. Yes, a lot of his stuff is film scoring. What are you doing the rest of your life? Was from the happy ending, perhaps most famously the windmills of your mind, from the Thomas Crown Affair, which won a best song uh, in terms of the Oscars. He wrote, "You must believe in spring. Once upon a summer time, the summer knows summer me, winter me." Uh, and he wrote with Alan, Alan and Marilyn Bergman. They were the lyricists he worked with. Uh, and they asked him how he got the ideas for these songs, which seemed to be seasonal. And he said, don't ask me, ask the Bergmans, because he did not write any words. Yeah, he just wrote the music. He just wrote and the music. Uh, figured out what it was saying. And, 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 and again, without he's just a great musician, uh, is really what it comes down to. And, and he, so Bourne says there are a couple of great albums yes, that are worth Bourne listening Bourne talks to. about a lot of stuff. One uh, is Le Grand Jazz. Le Grand with, Jazz. And, and, and part of it, the appeal, according to Bourne, is he always was able to collect fantastic musicians. So to give you an idea, the album called Michel Le Grand, uh, Le Grand Jazz has on it Miles Davis, uh, Bill Evans, John Coltrane, uh, Ben Webster, uh, Herbie Mann. Uh, it's kind of unbelievable. And, right. uh, and he says the Sarah Vaughan. He says the Sarah Vaughan album, album is that the two uh, of them did together. There's a Lena I'd Horn like album. I love that. I love Sarah Vaughan. There's a Steph, uh, Stephen Grappelli album. But you know, my favorite. Uh, I haven't heard of all these things. But one thing I do listen to is this. There is a YouTube video of a performance with uh, Michelle Grant with Claude Bowling, who's another great uh, uh, French um, jazz pianist, uh, and Oscar Peterson, the greatest jazz pianist, and the three of them play together. Uh, and it's fantastic. And they play The Windmills of Your Mind and, uh, and something by Claude Bowling, and they play Fur Jaca. I mean, yeah. it's just insane. So it, you might look at that. So that would that. be a good listen. Also, yeah. there was an article by Melissa Errico. Yeah, no, I mentioned that. I think uh, that's it. Well, I'm just, uh, she describes him as a, a man full of so much energy. Yeah. And uh, a really kind of fun story where he invites uh, she and her husband yeah. to fly to Spain from Paris right. with him. Turns out it's in his little airplane yeah. with him piloting. Yes. Um, so that sounds like and, quite and, and an And then adventure. they get there and, and Melissa's husband, who's of course with Patrick McEnroe, John McEnroe's brother, has to drive crazily through this town in Europe in this unbelievable weather to try to get while where they have riding, to go. While he's practicing, yeah, practicing for his in concert. the back seat. He and has he, some kind of little wooden keyboard. Right. And then he gives this great concert. Uh, so, so that's, that's kind of a fun story. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, great musician. And, then, and the other obituary that we'll just talk about briefly, and just it's kind of an interesting story, but not too famous, uh, a woman named Margot Rodriguez, who was half of an innovative uh, mambo duo. She was part of the team called Augie and Margot. And that was, of course, her husband, Augie, Augustine Rodriguez. Uh, they just met. Uh, she was in New York. And they clicked as dance partners when the Mambo got big in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And they were great performers doing the Mambo. So they appeared on the Steve Allen Show, the Arthur Murray Show, the Ed Sullivan Show. They opened for Sammy Davis, for Frank Sinatra in Vegas, for Dean Martin in Las Vegas. They were great Mambo performers. And what's interesting is... That they they stopped dancing really in this way in 1980. Uh, by that time, they were fairly far along. But they got back into the game for Cirque du Soleil because in their Las Vegas show, apparently, 
as recently as uh, 15 years ago, when they were in their mid-70s, what they would do with the Las Vegas Cirque du Soleil show is that uh, the Cirque du Soleil performers would ask for volunteers from the audience <laughs> <laughs> to do some dance. They were going to teach them some dance. Yeah. which turned out to be the Mambo. And Augie and Margo in their mid-70s would raise their hands <laughs> and get chosen as volunteers. And they would come down and they would... Uh, do the mambo, and they have a quote from their uh, their son Richard. It says they would go up, quote, and bring down the house. Oh, I bet. I, bet. <laughs> I can that just must imagine. Have been fun to see. Yeah, I thought that was a great story. But I did promise a quote from Tony Romo, and it's uh, apt because it's football. And here's this is what Tony Romo said when he retired. It was just a year or two ago. Here's the quote. He says, I just want to leave you with something I've learned in this process. He said, referring to his quarterbacking years. I feel like we all have two battles or two enemies going on. One with the man across from you. The second is with the man inside of you. I think once you control the one inside of you, the one across from you doesn't really matter. Tony Romo, you're a guy. I like it. I yeah. like it. Uh, so that's about it. Are we going to try to put in some music from Legrand? Uh, if we can. I don't All know. Right. We'll, right. see. we'll see. We'll uh, see. Uh, that's what it is if it turns up. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, this is Tamsin Green. And Dan Have you hop. Tamsin and Dan reading the paper. See you next week. See you. Comme pierre que l'on jette dans l'eau vive d'un ruisseau. Derrière elle, des milliers de ronds dans l'eau, comme un manège de lune, un cheveu d'étoiles, comme un anneau de Saturne, un ballon de carnaval, comme le chemin de ronde que font sans cesse les heures, le voyage autour du monde, d'un tournesol dans sa fleur.